Hi, I'm Ed Sperling. I'm the Editor-in-Chief of Semiconductor Engineering. I'm here with Willard Two of Xilinx. We're going to talk today about LiDAR. So LiDAR is one of the three main ways of detecting objects in the road as you go down and centering the, the uh, car on the road and figuring out where you are. You've got cameras, you've got radar, and you've got LiDAR, which typically is this spinning thing on top of these uh, vehicles that they're testing out. Where are we today and how has this been evolving? Well, it's a very evolving market, Ed. Uh, as you can see in the marketplace right now, most of the LiDAR applications are, are used on what we call robo-taxi or robo-trucks. And so that's the most pervasive area. But we are now starting to see adoption on regular passenger-owned vehicles. One of the big problems with LiDAR has been the fact that it, it is so compute-intensive, right? That is correct. The But the compute intensive Intensiveness does vary from approach to approach. We do see a wide range of different types of compute capability, and it varies with different types of specifications, like number of channels that you might be putting in your LiDAR. So some people might only have 16 channels, and then some of them are going all the way to 128 channels. And so you can imagine the amount of uh, points in your point cloud that are, is being generated uh, that would increase uh, significantly the processing capability or requirements. Is that all about resolution or is it about understanding exactly what you're seeing in terms of let's filter out certain things and let's include other things? Well, certainly resolution is perceived to be the way to help. Uh, um, if you think about it, Ed, um, when we see a picture, an, a regular picture uh, from a camera, you know, that's a fairly high resolution image. And a point cloud is trying to generate that. The more points you put into that point cloud, the greater that image looks. It, it looks more obvious of what you're looking at. But at the same time, when you're doing that, you're adding more cost or more processing capability. So some of the companies that are doing LiDAR are trying to go with lower resolution approach. And again, that means you have fewer points to figure out what it is. But that's where CNN becomes the great equalizer. Uh, convolutional neural nets are really able to help even with not a fully, um, uh, you know, an image that's not apparent can still do the detections that you need to figure out what it is. Uh, and it certainly really helps to have a higher resolution. So let's drill down into this. Sure. Willard, what are we looking at here? This is a graphic we put together to help show where we see the LiDAR market today. At the top, you can see that we've kind of tracked that certain companies like Strobe and Princeton Lightwave and Blackmore have been acquired by other entities. And then there are several companies like Velodyne, Luminar, and Ava that have gone through what we call a SPAC, a special purpose acquisition company, to go public. And so those companies are certainly working with many of the companies that we see on the bottom here in the red boxes and the blue boxes. The red boxes indicate companies that we're well aware of that have what we call firm timing or committed OEMs. And you can see the brands here, the car manufacturers like Audi. Hyundai, BMW, uh, SAIC, Volvo, and Xpeng have all committed to putting LiDAR on their passenger vehicles. So we're excited to see this trend. Uh, we've seen an increase of order intake to commensurate with these future LiDAR builds that are coming. Are all these companies moving in sync? We've had 905 and 1,515 nanometer wavelengths. We've had different fields of vision. Is there now a standard that says you have to be here or is everybody now doing their own thing because this, this is such a new technology? It's such a new technology, Ed. You're absolutely 100% right on that. The specifications vary significantly from vendor to vendor. And again, it, I think it also matters on what kind of LiDAR you're trying to use. Most of the ones we see right now that are committed to production are what we call a forward-looking long-range LiDAR. But um, certainly there are many LiDARs that could be shorter range purposes. You know, maybe you can have one on the corner or on the side to help give you a 360 view. And of course, we all have seen the, what I call the Kentucky Fried Chicken bucket that's been on many systems, but now they've reduced that to what we call a puck. And a lot of those puck or Kentucky Fried Chicken bucket LIDARs were certainly popular with the robo-taxi market. And, and that's largely because those guys didn't really care as much about the aesthetics of the vehicle, where all these other LIDAR companies we're seeing here in the red, the majority of them are all focused on what I call fixed field of view LIDAR, so that, that we can, get, can be integrated much more easily and look more aesthetic to the vehicle. You're processing a lot of data here because what you're dealing with is really almost a uh, deep neural network, right? 
Ed, that's a really good point. What we see in many of these systems is CNN is being widely adopted for LiDAR sensors. And that could be for automotive applications and many other applications. And the reason that is, is CNN is able to be trained very quickly and requires a lot less design resources to do what we call traditional CV, where you really need to have a lot more programming of where the edges are, uh, what are you detecting for those edges. Again, this is where CNN is kind of the great equalizer and all these point clouds do tremendously well with CNN processing. A couple of the issues that's cropped up in the past are things like when you're looking at a bright sun reflecting off of a white object, for example, that doesn't necessarily show up with classic LIDAR. And there's also things like whiteouts and fog where you have to deal with, you can't quite see through it and the LIDAR doesn't penetrate that. But this can be compensated for, right, with more computing? Yes, computing does solve that. There's a lot more pre-processing that you can do. And again, uh, having the ability to use CNN capability does benefit compared to other sensors that might use, such as you know cameras and things like that. What other challenges are you seeing with this? Well, I think the challenges is, I think we all know there's commercial challenges in the, in the marketplace right now, but we're starting to see that being addressed. As the market has shrunken down, there's fewer players. And with fewer players, it becomes more focused on which ones are emerging. And that's one reason we put that earlier chart together. We're trying to track which, which companies are really the ones that are emerging as winners. And I think with less confusion in the marketplace, there'll be more focus, more volume for the ones that are, are remaining. You've also got a massive amount of data coming in here. How does that get sorted out? Well, I think a lot of people that are, are in this particular space are generating what we call data sets. And the different types of data sets would be used to train their, their CNN networks. But it's always a, a classic situation with data collection. Many times when you're driving down the road, it's basically the same scene, the same situation over and over and over. But people People want to collect what we call the corner cases, the unique situations, as you kind of indicated earlier, of maybe there's some glaring light, there's foggy conditions. These are all more what we call corner cases or special conditions. And we need those particular data sets to really help train those point clouds or those CNN processing engines. Because, you know, like, you, you know, driving down the road under normal conditions, that's not a difficult situation to collect. That's why I think there's a lot of emphasis on collecting data to help do the training of these uh, neural nets. If you have three different inputs, so cameras, uh, radar, LIDAR, and one of those is potentially wrong or inaccurate, how does the car now know which one to use? It's a great challenge for any person that's using multiple sensors. This is where sensor fusion is coming into play. The developer of that system needs to assess the reliability of the data that each one is sending. So having three different sensors give you three different data points. But again, some of them are working on what we call advanced sensor fusion, where they're fusing uh, the camera data with the LIDAR data or the camera data with the radar data. And that just gives a, a richness of data to help eliminate what we call that false positives situations that happen in the system. So the developers of these systems are dealing with very complex software strategies to help mitigate exactly what you discussed. So what does this data actually look like? How much data are you getting in here and what do you have to go through in order to come up with an accurate solution? Ed, let me share with you a video that we've taken. So here, what you can see is in this particular video, uh, what, what you can see is that we have a point cloud, and in the point cloud, you can see it's processing all the different data points, and it's identifying the green boxes, which is other vehicles. And so this is the power of LiDAR today and the combination with the CNN capability. Uh, these things working together, uh, again, having more resolution is beneficial, but at the same time, the CNNs are able to do the identification that's needed um, in this particular case. Given the fact that all this is changing all the time and you have so many pieces in play, how do you develop a chip that is going to work for potentially the lifetime of a, a the vehicle, which is what the, I think some of the German car makers are asking for 18 years at this point? 
longevity of supply is a big concern for any semiconductor supplier these days. And that's something that's uh, true to Xilinx DNA. Not only are we focused on the automotive market, pretty much all the markets that Xilinx focus on are what we call long tail markets. And so it plays very well for us, longevity of supply. You know, we're involved in aerospace and defense. Uh, we're involved in uh, industrial, scientific, and medical. All these marketplaces want to have long-term supply, and automotive is certainly one of those. So supply is really not an issue for us when, when we talk about longevity. But how about in terms of the algorithms that are running on here, for example, can you continually adapt these systems in order to be able to take advantage of new standards, new uh, protocols, and whatever you're trying to do on a car where we, other pieces are changing as well? That, that is a unique capability of our programmable logic. In fact, uh, there's a concept we call OTA silicon, over-the-air updates of the silicon. We use software to reprogram the, the logic, uh, the hardware logic that's on the device. And so, as you can imagine, the techniques both in the signal processing and the techniques for the convolutional neural networks are absolutely adapting and changing over time. You know, CNN itself, there's many new techniques that are being implemented. And so we can then reprogram those capabilities over and over in our device. So you don't have a fixed device that cannot adapt to the marketplace. So that is definitely one of the advantages and probably one of the reasons we've been selected across many of the LiDAR manufacturers is exactly for that reason. They've improved their signal processing to reduce their thermal footprint. They've improved their CNN capability so they can get higher levels of detection classification. Another problem with LiDAR has been the cost. And part of that has been the fact that it's been multiple chips in the past. Is it net, is a single chip solution now available or is it better to have this in multiple chips? It's still multiple chips right now. I mean, you really see two devices dominate the system. One is an analog front end. And that's where many of the LiDAR companies have made what we call an ACE sick to help address that. And then the back end, what we call the digital processing, digital signal processing. And so in those situations, it's really a, a largely a two chip solution today. How about the ruggedness of these designs? Because they have to sometimes work in extreme conditions. Well, that's where we've seen the market really, you saw on that earlier graphic I showed like companies like Ava working with ZF. The tier one has a lot of experience in the ruggedization of technology. And and that's why we see a lot of the LiDAR companies, the startups that have been working in the marketplace where they've developed and approved the technology itself, partner with a major tier one to get that help understanding how to ruggedize the technology. There's also been a move to actually limit the data at the source too, right? So instead of sending everything that comes into a, a sensor into a central processor, now you're trying to do more wherever that sensor is because you don't, it's expensive to move that, that data. So that's a great point. Well, that's one reason why we developed the LiDAR DPU that we showed you. What we think is the in the in the interim right now, which would be beneficial to the marketplace, is having all that processing on the edge makes it easier because of the networking capability of some of the vehicles. So it's it's difficult to stream all the point clouds. Not that it's impossible, but you're going to have a much more advanced network to stream the point cloud. So here, if you in the LiDAR you're doing the signal processing and you're doing the perception, the CNN, then you're only doing object-oriented data that you can do on a CAN bus. But if you want to stream that point cloud, then you're going to have to use like Ethernet type of uh, connectivity to get over to the domain and then the domain will do the perception, which is the classification and identification. Where does security fit into this? People have been thinking about more security around all aspects of a vehicle. LiDAR is a potential attack surface for this, right? Yes, I mean, that's a, that's a concern in the marketplace in general. And I, I, obviously, Xilinx has been a leader in security with our aerospace and defense business. And we've implemented those same types of technology into the same devices that we're using for automotive as we do aerospace and defense. So our, our feeling is, you know, electronic warfare is probably the most advanced area of spoofing and things like that. We, we feel that we have that covered. Willard, too, thanks for a great explanation. Thank you for your time.